Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the panel discussion, uh, Beyond Expectations, Unconventional and Conventional Type Design. My name is Maurice Mayer, and I'm an assistant professor of graphic design at Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa. And it's my pleasure to serve as the chair MC timekeeper for our panel, and on everyone's behalf, to thank the Type Weekend organizers um, for inviting us and for all of their hard work in putting this conference together. Our conversation partners for this panel are Marta Bernstein, uh, joining us from Seattle. She's an independent educator and senior designer at Studio Matthews. She's a senior consulting partner at TMA Studio, and she is one of the co-founders of the Italian Type Foundry cast and the Nebbiolo History Project. Uh, Paul McNeil, joining us from London, is a typographic designer, educator, and author, uh, notably of The Visual History of Type, which was published by Lawrence King in 2017. Laura Meziger, uh, joining us from Barcelona, is a freelance graphic and type designer, the founder of the Typotones Foundry, and along with Cristobal Enestrosa and Jose Scalion, she's a co-author of, it appeared in English as How to Create Typefaces in 2017, but was originally published in 2012. Among many other activities, Laura is a board member of A-Type-I, and she and Marta are both among those responsible for alphabets.org. Hamish Muir, also joining us from London, is a graphic and typographic designer. who's a co-founder of the London Design Studio 8VO and co-editor of the studio's more or less eponymous journal, Octavo. And of course, he and Paul are together the Design Studio and Type Foundry, if they'd accept the label, Muir McNeil. And finally, Elmar Stefan, joining us from Oslo, is an independent type designer, historical researcher, and lecturer. He's the founder of the Pite Foundry and a frequent collaborator on type design projects, notably with Johannes Long, with whom he also conducts ongoing research into non-alphabetic typographic forms at nonalphabets.no. So our panelists are all writers and educators and active type and typographic and graphic designers, and they're going to be talking today, again, about conventional and unconventional type and typographic design. And I'd like to start the conversation today by asking our panelists, in turn, to help map out the terrain of our conversation by asking them what differences between the conventional and the unconventional are worth attending to today in type design and the typographic landscape, and how have those distinctions changed over time? So who'd like to start us off? Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it can be me, it's okay, it, it can be me. Um, what I have in the, okay, hello everybody. Um, I have been uh, taking some notes about uh, these concepts these last days because I thought it was going to be also a good thing to order my, my brain a little bit because there's a lot of things in, this, in the question, you know. So I'm trying to define to myself if I had to tell my students today what is a conventional type design and which in com what is unconventional type design, what I would tell them. You know? and, and then... Uh, I try to make it very simple, saying that conventional is uh, this type design is following some precedents, like uh, something that is uh, already done and already you know, shown. And conventional is something that is following this, uh, this path that are already there. And unconventional, they are these typefaces that don't follow those precedents, and they break the rules in a way or another. No? So having this in mind, no? For me, it's like a, unconventional. It's something that is more um, breaking rules. Uh, something that is more like a typefaces that explore boundaries. Unconventional is typefaces that are more in functional in a way that they are in a more limited space, trying to to fill a space that is more in a, in the functional way. No? And unconventional are typefaces that explore or a kind of language expression trying to be also something that calls your attention more unconventional, in a way. But then I started to think more about this, no? And now we are more and more, we have unconventional typefaces that are also used in a conventional way, unconventional typefaces that are used in an unconventional way. So it's not only about the typeface, it's also about how you use it, you know? Always, always. <laughs> so then it's a, a complete, let's say it's a mix about also, which is the, 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 the shape of the letter and how you use this letter. So I think we have uh, this mix um, there. We also always have it there. 
But for me now, what I see in the unconventional designs is what my students are looking for, for instance, when they want to do something special. So when you are looking for something different, then you're looking for something unconventional, no? And when you are looking something more serious and sober, then you look for something more conventional, no? And this is what they have in their minds, no? When they want to call the attention, they want to look for something different, no? So unconventional for me now is something more that it's looking for originality, something that is completely different, something that calls attention, no? But it's difficult for them to to find something unconventional that is also functional, you know, because it's always this anecdote somewhere here and there. And for them, it's difficult to understand that uh, it needs to, they need to look for a balance, you know, in what is conventional and conventional to, to follow the function of the graphic design piece, more or less. This is, our, this is my, <laughs> my five cents on that. <laughs> Um, I would, hello everyone, um, I would, I agree totally with this. I was also sort of struggling because um, with the definition, because sometimes instead of unconventional, the word experimental is used, though I think unconventional, it's a better word because somehow implies that you know the conventions and you're trying to break some. So it's more from the type design point of view, while also I'm thinking of my students when they do experiment with letters, they don't necessarily experiment with the identity of letters or what the tools, the elements that you would use with letters, but more as an approach with graphic designers, changing letters, which is also interesting, but those are sort of two different things that are quite difficult for me to also explain students that don't know what type design is. So um, this sometimes is the path of type designers or people that have experience in drawing letters. They do a very, um, I don't know, conscious experiment, knowing what are the conventions or what's the also, mm. not necessarily the um, visual features, but also the process can be unconventional and the result can be conventional. There are so many different aspects in designing letters or designing typefaces um, that can be conventional or unconventional. So for instance, mm. the output could be conventional looking, but the process could be very unconventional by be, I don't know, completely programmed or generated or something that it's not the usual path for designing a typeface. So it's, it's a tricky definition because also it's evolving very fast. Mm. So something that is conventional now or established maybe wasn't conventional five years ago or 10 years ago. Uh, for instance, I'm thinking of typefaces that use reverse contrast that is sort of becoming a trend and now a lot of typefaces, not a lot, but there are many more options if you want to design something I want to use something that has a reverse contrast compared to, I don't know, 50 years ago, for instance. Cool. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's um, maybe a slight uh, misdirection to put the unconventional as a kind of diametric opposite to the conventional. Uh, it certainly has to be said that the entire history of graphic design in the 20th century is one of each generation of designers rejecting the previous generation and trying to displace it with new approaches, new technology, so on and so forth. But if you visualize convention more as the entire remit of the traditions of our culture, of which type and type design is one aspect, then really the unconventional is the crusty bit at the edge of that nebulous cloud that is maybe directing things forward towards new opportunities and new possibilities. Um, and I think there are many, many examples of that in the current era, but you can see that in any era. You can see that in the designs of John Baskerville or um, Bodoni or Dido. Um, design is always about trying to address the conventions and 
find new conventions, find new ways of dealing with those conventions. I've got a lovely quote, um, which I would love to be able to read to you. Um, it's from Stanley Morrison, who is very famous. Um, what was he? He was the director of monotypes, development of typefaces in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, and I don't know when he said this or in what context, but he said, uh, what they call originality is achieved by getting down to the root principle underlying the practice. From that origin, you can think your way back to the surface where you may find you're breaking untrodden ground. And to my mind, that is all about the depth and resolution of being able to interrogate convention, address convention, and then drive things forward as a result of your understanding of that. Fantastic example in very recent days is the new typeface from Chris Sowersby of Klim, a uh, typeface called Signified, which um, works with entirely with Bezier structures to create something that uh, at, at readable sizes looks absolutely meticulous and perfect, but at large sizes exposes its construction method in a very clear and articulate way. And there are many other examples as well, but I won't go on, it's somebody else's turn. <laughs> May I? Yeah, Stefan, you look like you're ready. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, it might be plain obvious that the conventional and the unconventional are somehow mutual um, influences on each other and have a relation. Um, I think in uh, the realm of typography, it's um, it, at least Western typography, it's the broad nip pen that declared um, convention in the first place. But then it seemed that typography got bored with its own established convention very fast and was more and more emancipating itself from that um, initial um, convention and was somehow as it, at, at its most radical, I feel, when there is outside influences. Um, I don't know, with Griffo's uh, italic, handwriting was coming back in. It was already a step further, but handwriting was taken uh, back in. Or later on with copper plate engraving, uh, the Romain de Roi that was um, a cutting edge uh, at that time. Uh, when uh, lithography was coming in, um, this was highly influential on typographic shapes and there was a pressure in, the, in typography to, to explore more expressive um, uh, forms. The beginning of the 20th century fine arts as a, as a as a, as a holding point, as an echo um, coming into um, uh, typographic design. And later on, com computers and technology, I'm thinking about Knut, uh, uh, Donald Knut, and in our situation where these, the boundary between the outside and the inside of typographic design is much, it's, is, is blurring in, um, is blurring big times as uh, graphic designers are coming in and pushing type design, um, oh. not into its boundary, um, but somehow um, defining it anew. I, I yeah. quite agree with you, Stefan. And, and uh, uh, I think that a lot of what you're talking about is to do with the ways in which new materials and new technologies afford new thinking very often they go hand in hand with changes in ide ideology. Uh, the one thing you didn't really mention is the enormous transition that happened in the early 19, well, late 1980s, early 1990s with the advent of personal computing. Um, those are some of the most cutting edge things that have ever been done in my opinion. And nowadays we sort of ignore them because they've become those kind of retro, Susanna Lishko, um, Barry Deck, um, Cal, uh, that sort of thing, you know, but um, it's definitely a huge contribution to the way in which ideas drive forward, for sure. Cool. Hamish, I think you wanted to step in. Well, it's a very hard act to follow, my colleagues. <laughs> um, just 
I mean, I don't know whether this is because of the time that we've been living in for the last six months, but um, the disconnection at the moment between letter forms and their reception seems to me to be almost uh, an unbridgeable gap in that um, where does type end up now? Um, it, you know, printing, uh, and as the other, uh, as Stefan and Paul would both mentioned, that um, type conventions change as technology changes. But somehow at the moment, we don't even have a fixed space in which type is operating. It's very fluid and very um, tangential often. And, and you, you know, it's, it's no longer um, sometimes the, the primary means of conveying information in, in multimedia, um, which we've all been kind of, well, I've grown up with really, I suppose, um, in, in a sense. So I just wonder whether we can even talk about what is conventional or unconventional when we don't really understand um, the environment in which language is working. Or maybe I don't, anyway. Um, so I find it all very confusing, very sort of, um, I mean, the further you look back at graphic design, it was very concrete when it was printing. Um, and, you know, things had object quality, they had presence, whether it was a poster or a book or whatever. But now most people experience, their experience of the current um, outputting graphic design is via things like Instagram, where they never ever see the printed thing. So we've got this complete other reality going on, which is screen-based. And it's often not screen-based communication, but it's pictures of things which are pretending not to be screen-based, um, when they might just be fictitious, <laughs> they might only be a Photoshop mock-up or something. So um, where type sits in all of that, I've, I've got kind of no idea. Um. I think that the more, for me, how it's always connected like this, how is graphic design evolving, you know? And I mean, I think type is always in, is, a, is a serving graphic designers in a way. So what I, we see now in design is more and more this uh, idea of motion. So motion seems to be the next thing in graphic design, like everything needs to be motion. And if it's not in motion, it's not there. It's uh, this, this thing, no? It's especially because for instance, it started in Instagram, actually. I may be wrong, eh? but in Instagram, in a moment, everything was playing. And then when something was moving, it was calling the attention. You know? So now the movement is becoming more and more normal in branding, for instance. So we are now talking about uh, brands in movement, branding in movement. No? And it's something that is implemented also in the graphic design education as well. No? How to move uh, your logos, how to animate your branding, how to make campaigns that the messages are moving around. So I think that now because of movement, there's, there will be a, mo a moment that everything is moving and then you cannot see anything anymore. And, and then you need to be, and everything is being static again. <laughs> I think it's going to happen for real. And then, so we were talking recently about virtual reality, you know, anti-faces for virtual reality. That is, is something that is not implemented at all. And it's really, so technology is always there. And graphic designers are mostly the ones who implement technology. So typefaces are serving graphic designers. And now we are always following these needs, no? So which typefaces are easy to move in a motion? How, how do you do it? And actually variable fonts that are, is what people are mostly applying, even in motion, they are a bit, uh, what's it, they are a bit frustrated, the animators, because variable fonts don't work in all the softwares, no? And so we have now in this moment where everybody wants to have something that we are trying to reach there. So variable fonts are moving really fast because graphic designers are waiting for them in a way no? to be able to do everything with them. And all this experimentation that we have in variable fonts with different uh, axes or strange axes or, you know, or peculiar axes are going moving towards that, no? what the designers are looking for. I want a typeface that is unserif and becomes a super thin serif 
I don't know, whatever, no? Something that is, is morphing, a continuous morphing, no? And I think we are there now, but what I'm always observing is that uh, it's this idea of uh, what is the concept, no? So for me, it's, uh, it's this thing about how to put together the graphic design project with the concept and how typefaces serve the concept, no? And what I see now, this is a lot of experimentation just uh, in tools, no? Like uh, moving around things, what is put movement. Let's, but, uh, you know, and I think that uh, we are in a moment that, because you have it was you were saying that, saying that because of COVID and all these things, we are maybe a bit stuck or like, uh, yeah, but I think at the same time, our, people are taking time to experiment with things they never did before. And they are trying to find things that are really making them a bit different in a way. But for me, for instance, I always talking about Wiggins because yeah, I'm super fond of Wiggins and, and who is not fond of Wiggins? <laughs> Maybe this is the other question, no? So all these things we were, he, he was doing these uh, experiments manually. So, so he, I mean, it was the concept was there, no? How things look, we're talking about the uh, signifier uh, and this that it was, it's very functional in a small sizes and when it's big, you see it in another way. So Dwiggins was doing, doing the same thing already, you know? So the concept it was already there, no? It's, it's how different people develop the same concept. It is something that it really, really amazed me, you know? Same concept, how different type, type designers or graphic designers put it in a different way. So what I want to say is that it's just, it's a lot, a lot of things going on and technology facilitates the exploration. And now more and more people are able to explore different ways. And what I find now is that uh, people are more uh, into a expressive time. I, 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 I see this thing of uh, looking for expression more. I mean, we have, I'm saying again because of my students, also because maybe I'm more in this side, like expressive uh, design. But I see more and more my students trying to be more expressive and trying to be more emotional no? in, in design. And all these things of movement and the straight shapes and all these things seems to serve them better. But always thinking about graphic design. I mean, I don't have any, any students that are, are creating type design only for, you know, without a concept behind. And I think this has been always the same, you know. But now it's bigger, so it's much bigger. And, and then they need to try to, you know, find their own way. But all everybody goes to the same way. Now you were talking before, Steph, about reverse, you, Marta, you were talking about reset, re, reverse contrast. No? And it's, but now for me, the new thing of sort of new is that, okay, let's make grotesque, grotesque type faces, but all the grotesque look the same, but try to find the detail in the grotesque. So, so how to change tiny details? So how to carve a little bit the tail of the R? How to make a bit longer the tail of the A, you know? But it's still being a grotesque typeface, no? Because this is a sort of trend. So I don't know. I don't know. I think there's a lot of people doing a lot of stuff. We have more type designers than ever. <laughs> no. And trying to make something original and different is, is quite challenging, no? So this is why when you have a concept behind it, it's much easier and much uh, and originality can be there as well it can be there just because of the concept it's very original i think since all of us on this panel are involved in graphic design and visual communications we do see it from within that framework and we do look at all these details and understand them with interest but within a wider cultural frame I think there is a complete rejoinder to everything that Hamish has been saying and, and, and Laura has been saying, um, which is that, um, which is summarized beautifully in a quote that I found the other day. I'm sorry, <laughs> I've been finding quotes because I have no original thoughts. I just find other people's thoughts. This is from Derek Birdsall, who's a very famous English editorial designer, book designer, um, probably now in his 80s, I would have thought. Um, but uh, he was asked uh, in a profile of himself recently, uh, he says, uh, it's, this is a very reactionary view, but I do think it is quite useful within a wider cultural frame. He says, I can't help thinking that books and now perhaps websites are really the proper stuff of design. 
all the rest is playtime. And it is arguable that nowadays we have a heck of a lot of playtime. We've got more playtime during coronavirus than we ever have. And, you know, graphic design and being unconventional is very much about play, about exploration without necessarily having a scientific attitude towards experimentation. Um, but then again, perhaps the kind of cultural weight of that does still persist in websites that are obliged to communicate corporate information clearly or books or magazines that are obliged to follow the same laws that they've been following since the 15th century. Um, there's nothing wrong with expression. There's nothing wrong with um, looking at the cutting edge, but ar arguably it's that kind of cultural mass that is of more depth and significance and is what you see in the design work of the really articulate and engaged um, type designers, um, such as, well, Sowersby and many others, you know. Um, I don't want to give lists of names here. <laughs> yeah, it sort of reminds me, uh, Paul, um, you know, not to drag too much out of the present US electoral context, but I remember in 2016, you know, being warned that electing uh, Hillary would put taco trucks on every corner in the city and me thinking that sounded more like a feature than a bug. <laughs> what you were saying about Derek Birdsall's comment, like playtime, I'm, sounds great to me. Yeah. Um, no, and um, so, you know, one of the, the next question that we discussed as a panel that we wanted to cover, it sounds like you all have very seamlessly started to move into. Um, uh, because the message that I'm getting from just about everybody's response, I'm thinking particularly first of what Laura and Marta had to say, but that, you know, if I can put it sort of in a capsule form, it seems like there's a big difference between asking this sort of convention, unconvention locally as opposed to globally. And then as soon as you move away from a very local context, these boundaries become very indistinct, right? Even to the point where, as Marta suggested, you know, getting even beyond what you actually see there are, could be unconventional methods of arriving at conventional solutions um, or that look conventional on the surface at least. And I find that really fascinating. So maybe I wanna sharpen up our next question and maybe ask, um, instead of just simply, where do we see challenges between uh, what may locally look like unconvention and convention playing out? Um, where do we see those confrontations being the most fruitful and why, and maybe where do we see those confrontations being less fruitful? And is there a way of maybe reframing those confrontations between unconventional and conventional approaches that might be more productive um, if we think of that? And maybe throw that out to the panel. Um, one thing I think that also um, Laura stressed is that the concept I think sometimes I see experiment in letter shapes that are born more out of just experiment for the sake of it, instead of having more of a concept or trying to, I don't know, find something deeper. So the risk that also I'm seeing, again, with students in graphic design is to separate something that is the result of a concept to something that is more just copying or being part of a trend, being more, a bit more manieristic in the way of the approaches. Because of course, um, there are, um, I don't know, interesting, sometimes you just need to go a little bit deeper. I think one of the issues that I see with my students also is uh, because most of what they digest is just a list of images, whatever it's Pinterest or Instagram, there's not much deep, uh, depth in what they see, they tend to just copy what they see without understanding much of what generated it. So the process, the concept, so the risk of being, ex like the bad side of being unconventional and experimental is that it can be just like as a trend and being manieristic so that if you design a typeface, you have to have something that is different so that um, that to me is sometimes the risk when everything that is digested is without any, I don't know, criticism or uh, 
ability to analyze and understand what is going on. Um, And so, at, and at times like that, then you're suggesting that might be where unconventionality may not be at its most productive when confronting the conventional, that there needs to be some more depth at least to those efforts for them to really serve might be one way of reading what you're saying. Yeah, it's general. I mean, it has happened. It's, it's a it repeats, story. He repeats itself with every innovation that then becomes a trend and then it's sort of um, adopted without the concept that was behind it and then there's a rejection of it and then it's sort of moving this way and that happened I don't know with Baroque and Rococo the difference was the being more mannerist about it and it's also something that can happen with just copying something without understanding the process or the concept sorry the context that generated it because also we have to remember ourselves as we were saying that graphic design or design does not happen in the vacuum is the product of the current times so that's also something that needs to be understand that if nothing has a everything is contemporary to us now students just see things that were designed yesterday or 200 years ago and they don't see it as something different but they were the result of very different societies very different trends very different attitudes so um, that I think is one of the challenges of our current times. The concept part is, um, I think is key. So that unconventional experimentation don't get lost into just doing something nice or visual without a concept behind. Stefan, did you want to speak to that point? Yes, I, I don't want to deny uh, typographic design its artistic value but I still think that it's an economic discipline that you have to have economics in mind when designing. Mm -hmm. um, and there is this dilemma also working on custom type projects that people ask you or pe people, um, mostly graphic designers ask me in this case, as I speak from my example, uh, to design something that is very conventional, but has, this, has a certain kind of character that makes it unconventional. And I feel that is, that is a very superficial um, attitude, uh, also what uh, Laura and Marta said uh, uh, before. Um, and that maybe it's this um, confrontation of um, context, where it is used and where it comes from that is a, a more fruitful, um, uh, yes, confrontation. I was thinking in preparation uh, once again about the London Olympics. This was 2016, was it? This uh, black letter-like um, oh. um, style from uh, Gareth Haig, was it? Elias. Um, that, that was having such a big exposure, it somehow did more for unconventional type design than anything that is underground and just exposed to an audience that anyway is already on the, on the edge of itself if you understand what I'm saying. So it's this, this the context and the text and this uh, clash I feel is, uh, is uh, happening more active. Do you, do you feel it was received favorably, Stefan? Um, here in this house, yes. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, so here, also here. I mean, maybe for you that you were in London and you thought it was a terrible thing, but uh, from here it was seen as a way of a different, trying to find something different, but it's still uh, working, you know? I think so, most, of, most of Gareth Haig's typefaces seek to do that, but many of yes. them are a great deal better than what he did for the London Olympics. Yeah. That's my personal opinion. He's a, he's a really insightful and innovative designer who lives about five miles away from me, so... He'll be around my house later tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking isolation, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> so, but yes, yeah, so, but what I'm hearing from Marta and Stefan is that a lot of whether or not that confrontation is going to be fruitful or productive or not has a lot to do with, well, with the context in which it's occurring, but also the concepts behind them. And that there, there could be a superficial way of that confrontation happening that isn't, you know, and I suppose we would need to talk about what does count as fruitful, right? But 
there'd be a superficial way of that encounter happening and a not a, a deeper, uh, a more, um, more thought out uh, confrontation too. Um, what about the rest of us? Uh, you know, um, when do we see these confrontations um, producing something worth attending to, something, uh, something that advances type design or graphic design or both? When do we see it maybe interfering? Um, one, of the, one of the points that the panel had talked about in preparing for our conversation today uh, was taking specifically a look at the role of educational programs. And I wonder if, you know, based on at least a few things that Marta said, I wonder if it's worth spending some time at least for a minute uh, thinking about how this confrontation is um, framed or posed uh, by educators to students who are learning how to do type design or learning how to do graphic design. Is there a choices that we, I will say, could be making that could kind of encourage a more fruitful way of letting the unconventional and the convention uh, come together? Um, yeah, Hamish. Oh. You're on mute. Sorry. Um, could, I think it depends at which level the students are. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of my teaching experience has been to do with introducing the basics to, you know, first and second year students, um, basic typography, design systems, color, that kind of thing. And um, it's amazing how um, unfavorably those sorts of uh, core um, activities and disciplines are, are viewed by the management hierarchy generally. Um, you know, it's like, um, they're already graphic designers. They've already got their subscription to Creative Cloud, you know. All they want to do is to be given projects and to make things. Um, so I think it's one of the biggest challenges is to get people to look at the core basic things to do with visual communication, graphic design, typography, and type design. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's because of technology, it probably is, but, um, and everyone has the means to produce communication, visual communication, even when they arrive at university, you know. Um, whereas, you know, in, in my day when it was a mystery, how do things get printed? No one knew. And you gradually learn that, you know, you had to take a lot of care and a lot of time and work with a big team of people to get anything printed. Um, so I'm losing the thread here slightly, but just, cool. Sorry. just to the, the, those essential things, those questions of the way that communication is modulated through alphabetic form never change. Um, as long as we're reading the written word, they never change. And yet it seems at the moment that um, it, well, in my experience, um, and perhaps it was my perception only, that it was being ignored and not addressed at all. I think that um, Hamish and I obviously have quite a lot of experience in the English um, higher education system and both of us would probably agree that skills acqu acquisition is not really taught anymore. That is regarded as something that people can acquire for themselves uh, very much through things like lynda.com um, and that art schools uh, do something different nowadays which is far more, um, far less basic than the sort of thing that we're interested in. To bring it to specifically type design, almost every type designer I've ever known is really an autodidact. You know, people who have wanted to acquire this knowledge and have um, spent a lot of time digging into all the technicalities of it. Um, and I think the teaching of type design is not the sort of thing that happens at BA level in the UK. Um, uh, and is, to my mind, really the remit of very specialized courses of which there are probably only about 
five around the world that are really worth talking about. Maybe there are more. Again, I could give examples, but I'm reluctant to do so. <laughs> we can never know who's in the audience, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, because I, I have taught type design to students at various levels. It's, it's very dif different to teach type design to graphic designers because you're not teaching them to become graphic type designers. They're just a way to better understand how typefaces work, how alphabet works, maybe being able to, I don't know, draw letters for a logo better, but there's no, I don't know, more understanding the possibilities and tools and it's, or the way I teach it is more to try to go deeper into how typography and letter shapes work, how the Latin alphabet works. Um, and I think it's great that that is taught because in my opinion, that would probably make better graphic designers that are more aware of what they're looking at. Because what I think is, is sometimes missing in the teaching to go back to the previous question is um, it's difficult to make the student focus on the hard part of being a designer that is a lot of practice, a lot of basics. There's also studying because somehow the halo that is around the profession is more like, oh, you are, oh, this, you do such a creative work and there's not much of a hard work. Well, I think the knowing the, I don't know, practical skills and tools and developing a critical thinking, those two together can lead to very good designers. If you just have one or if you just have the other, you're still missing a part. And sometimes the critical thinking, I think, is what is the hardest in the educational system at the moment, because also, I don't know, students want to make things that will get likes on their portfolio or their Instagram. There's not which is understandable, of course, it's a tough word out, the, out there, but sometimes it's not maybe the best way on the long term. I don't know, I have a feeling that, I don't know, I, I'm teaching different things. I'm teaching type design, I'm teaching typography for editorial design as well. So it's, it's very nice for me to do both because then I can, you know, and I always tell the students of Thai design that they're, I mean, even if they are not becoming Thai designers, because a lot of them, this, after one year of course, they decided that they don't want to be a Thai designer. <laughs> this all happens, you know, because they think too hard and, and you need to be too focused and, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's not easy. Actually, from all of the students we have in, in the last 10 years, uh, eight of nine people only became type designers, you know. They were there by, there by curiosity to understand how type design works and that all of them became better graphic designers, I'm sure of that. They learned how to look at typefaces, they learned how to uh, distinguish one good typeface from another, they learned how to use type in a better way. So for, for us, this is one, the, one of the main goals, no? But I think the, the role of, of, uh, of uh, teaching is open windows of knowledge you know so and they have to understand to look at other things so my experience for instance when i was in type of media as a student um it was of course amazing i can't say anything <laughs> but about it but i will remember all my life when they told us you you are not we're not going to teach you to be type designers we're going to we're going to teach you how you can become a type designer you know, like, and this was through the tools. So it was not the goal to make of you a type designer, only showing you the tools, how a type designer is formed, you know, and then you have to choose your own way. So for me, the imprint that this uh, had on me was, was really strong. So there were two very big imprints. One was this, about the tools and the, to the use calligraphy, because I never did calligraphy before, and understanding the structure, everything from the beginning. So for me, it's the, when we learn about history and social aspects, and then you can have uh, a, a better knowledge of everything, of, and especially what you are doing. But the problem we have is time. You know how, how happens for you, but schools, they want to put so many things in one year, you know? I'm teaching in masters now, I'm not teaching in BAs. And, 
and they want to put everything, everything, and knowledge of five of ten years in one year, and that's impossible, you know. And for me, time is a big problem in education now, because you know when, I mean, it's say, it happens here in Spain. It's like this. I mean, we we don't have masters like type of media or reading or Amiens or you know or ECAL, where the student have uh, has forty hours a week to be in the academy to work. Here is, we only have 12 hours a week with the students, you know, and they have to work much more independently than in the class. You know? And for me, this makes a big, huge difference, you know, because if you have time, you have time to, to practice the tools. If you have time, you have time to talk with your colleagues. If you have time, you have time to debate with the teacher, you know, but if you don't have all this time, you cannot develop it better. So for me, it's a matter of time as well, you know, and now we are in a moment where everything has to be very fast, you know, everything needs to be very fast. Uh, for me, this is the biggest problem today, that also for us, when you get an assignment of a custom project, it either it's a logo or a typeface, it needs to be done really fast. So when you have to have this time, the development of the project, you have to put it inside the time you have, you know, so you cannot be deliberating much more, or et cetera. No? So I had a big difference with this when we did, for instance, the project of uh, typography matchmaking in the Maghreb, you know, that it was a, a full year of uh, a development of something that for me was completely new, but it's much based on something that I never saw before, as is the Arabic manuscripts of al you know? And then when you have this possibility of designing something in an unconventional way, you know, because for me it was to design lighting typefaces coming from Arabic, you know, it's when you can go also deeper in your own brain, you know, because then you are breaking something that you are doing in a regular way, the same kind of typefaces, this kind of logos, no? So what I'm trying to tell to my students is they need to, they need to book time. Uh, to do this experimentation, you know? And they are students and this is the time to do it, you know? They cannot pretend to do super experiments when they are working in, in, in the economical world already, you know, because of timing and budget. So, uh, so I think now when you have uh, these students who are curious, I'm trying also to, to show them some things that, things that are completely different, you know? For instance, for me, Irma Reiner is uh, one of my, these uh, designers I always look at because he managed to put all these kind of unconventional shapes on letters, you know? And I'm doing this as a size of a uh, tight cooker that was created by Eric Van Boglen. <clears throat> and it's amazing how the students also can do it. The only thing you have to do is to be with the students telling them you can do it, you know, and you can do unconventional design as well, and you can, you can draw. So for me now, the formula that I want to implement in the coming year is I want to force them to draw more, for instance, because I think they're going too fast into the computer and they are putting too much uh, decisions on the tools, you know, and they don't draw enough. So when you try to understand, to explain the student that drawing is something that they have to go further into drawing, they get to, they get more into, okay, looking at all the sources, trying to see, look at things that are least different or, you know, um, I don't know, I'm getting lost, <laughs> but, I think it's more about, yeah, ed education seems, needs to be more about encouraging the student to look for, for putting more time into it, you know. I had one student this year that he was really like, okay, not doing anything the weekends and working every week. So I, can't, I mean, we're super happy you are here, but honestly, if you are not working by yourself, it's going to be very difficult, you know, that you do this. and. When I was a student, I always was working very hard, trying to find something that I was uh, trying to understand better. So that's it. From here, I'll unmute. So, so yeah, it sounds like basically the, the consensus is that, you know, one of the challenges that instructors face today if trying to get their students to deal with, however we define it, a confrontation between the unconventional and conventional, is time, just being able to, to make space in the curriculum for it and to encourage students to make space for it. If we don't want them to simply treat it, as Marta was saying, as sort of just a, 
jumping on, you know, jumping on social media and, and picking off trends, um, you know, to get them to actually engage and do something fruitful with that confrontation. Um, we're coming sort of to the end of our scheduled time, and I wanted to know if um, just maybe offer out to the panel uh, a chance to just maybe say a last, uh, a last word or two, um, just to kind of think about sort of the message that you're taking away from our conversation today uh, regarding uh, unconventionality and conventionality uh, before we wrap things up. So um, if, anything has any, if anyone has anything to add, this would be a great time. I think what I'd like to say in, as a conclusion um, is an area that we haven't really managed to touch on, which is unfortunate. But there is a question as to whether we live in a golden age of type design and typography or whether we're suffering from a terrible glut, too many things being produced all the time. Um, I'm, I, I stand on the, on the first term. I think we're in a golden age myself, but nevertheless, I do feel the bombardment of visual material all the time somewhat hard to sustain. Anybody else? I kind of, I feel split between those two alternatives myself, Paul. Um, too many things to pay attention to, but at the same time, a lot of it looks glorious. It's the modern condition. It's not just specific to type design. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, if not, then I'd say that we are at the end of our time together. Um, so we should probably bring things to a close. Um, I just want to say, first of all, Marta, Paul, Laura, uh, Hamish and Stefan, thank you all so much uh, for taking the time to talk today, for sharing your insights, your thoughts with us. And on behalf of the panel, and we're going to move into a Q&A after this point, uh, on behalf of the panel, though, before that happens, I just want to thank everybody in the audience for joining us. Um, and also, again, to the Type Weekend organizers for inviting us to share this conversation with you. And we look very much forward to your questions. <laughs>